So it looks like Keith is just still having some technical difficulties. Uh, hopefully we'll get that sorted as soon as we can. Um, but for now, I'm going to jump ahead and I'm going to bring to stage our first speaker of the day, Pascal Herleman, who is the uh, head of NPD for Backles in Switzerland. And he's going to give you a great presentation on sourdoughs today. So I'm really excited to hear from him. Um, Pascal, hi. <laughs> Brilliant to see you. Do you want to um, give your quick introduction and I'll bring up your presentation for you? Perfect. So hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Pascal. Um, I used to do an apprenticeship as a baker, so I'm in a small craft bakery. So um, I know exactly what it is to, to do a wake up in the morning quite early and, and do the breads. And then uh, I went to uni, did my food science degree. And then I started 2012 uh, at Backles, um, and they sent me to different places within the Backles group. So I, I worked 12 months in the UK, 12, uh, 16 months in Australia, and uh, 10 months in New Zealand. And now I'm back in Switzerland, where I'm um, heading the, the MPD, but also I'm a member of the board of, of the Backles group. Uh, the Backles Brilliant. Group. I'm just uh, bringing your presentation up, so hopefully you should all be able to see it in just a second. Uh, bear with me one moment. I mean, I can start already a little bit. <laughs> I, mean, I have a, it's just, a, I have it's a, just a taking a while to load. Just, uh, here we go. Let's try this again. I mean, I have a 15 minutes um, time to talk about Here we go. Here we go. Can we see this? Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, just let me know if you want to switch slides and we'll go on. Perfect. Um, as I said, 15 minutes is not that much time to talk about those two really important topics or quite interesting topics, uh, artisan and sourdough. Um, so, but I will touch a little bit of the most important parts, which I think is, is quite important when we talk about artisan, but also sourdough. But if you have any questions, um, you can always send me an email um, when you have any questions or if you want to have the presentation. And I think Sophie is allowed to, to give you the presentation if, you, if you're interested. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the topic today is um, to the world of, of Firmdor and Firmdor is our sourdough brand and Firmdor contains the word fermented and door means gold. So we, we think that sourdough is a gold standard and that's why we put the name of our sourdough products um, onto Firmdor and we're producing sourdough since the 1970s. Um, so we do have a little bit of, of knowledge when it comes to sourdough. But the first um, part I will talk about artisan breads more artisan products. And Sophia can um, go further with the slide if possible. Perfect. And uh, you probably know that um, the, the growth in consumer demands for artisan bread is, is continuing and, and it's, it gets even further. And when I moved to uh, the UK 2012 for 12 months, I was quite amazed because um, you have a lot of sliced breads in your country and we only have sliced breads when it's Christmas and Easter. So I was quite fascinated. I thought every day is Christmas and, uh, and Easter because uh, we usually have artisan breads uh, on a daily basis and I was growing up with, with those products. Um, and there's a huge uh, potential um, in artisan, artisan products, uh, especially in the UK, but also in other countries um, where sliced bread is still um, quite often used um, today. You can go further, please. And what is required to make artisan breads? I mean, most of you know what is important. And one of the things is you need good ingredients. Um, and ingredients also includes not just flour and water and whatsoever and sourdough, but also time. You need time to give uh, the fermentation play, uh, to take place. And, and also the shape is quite important. And um, a lot of people forget that a, a bread has usually about 500 different aromas and 300 of them are located in the crust and about 200 in the crumb. And if you have a different ratio of crust to crumb, for example, in a baguette, you will have more flavors in the crust than in the crumb. Um, in comparison, when you're doing a batard, where the ratio of crust to crumb is a little bit different. So the shape also has an influence on the flavor of artisan products. Then also the baking process. Um, you can bake really high in temperature and really short, or you can bake it really long for uh, at the lower temperature. And fermentation also is quite important because um, artisan breads you can ferment for up to 24 or even 48 hours um, before it even goes into the oven. 
So I think that is also important. But one important part is also storytelling. I mean, if you advertise your products in the shop that you're using a recipe of your grand grandfather and you have used a special sourdough, you made a special sourdough to put into artisan bread, um, that is something which then will even give you, or your consumers then will even like it even further uh, and will buy that product because they have a story behind it. And that's quite important as well when you talk about artisan products. Okay, please further. But what is the main, um, or what's the key process for artisan products? And I compare it always to, to sliced breads um, in the UK. And the first stop, the mixing step, I mean, Usually in Switzerland, when we're making bread, we're mixing up to 25 minutes. Um, a sliced bread is usually done two minutes slow and six minutes fast. So we, we actually give it time to mix and, and properly develop the dough. Um, and also the hydration is much, much higher. I mean, we're talking here that, that you're using about 900 grams of water um, to one kilo of flour. So it's quite a sticky dough. So you need the time um, to make sure that the flour can absorb that high hydration. And then even the bulk fermentation can take up to 24 hours. So even small or short fermentation time of 60 minutes is already quite long compared to sliced breads where you don't do any um, bulk fermentation. And then scaling and molding is the same. And then proving again, you can um, prove up to 24 hours even in the fridge. I mean, we have a lot of products where we actually bake the next day. And that's also quite a nice thing because bakers usually wake up quite early in the morning. Um, but in Switzerland, we have a few bakers now who actually start working in, in the morning, let's say at six o'clock, and they're preparing the products for the next day because the fermentation time or the proving time is more than one day. And that usually helps that you actually can bake off in the morning quite late, the breads you made the day before, and um, you can prepare during the day the products for the next day. And the flavor and the crust is absolutely phenomenal because you give the time to go um, with the good flavor. And then the baking as well. I mean, the baking can take up to 60 minutes, um, but that's also um, due to the reason that you have a lot of water or hydration in there and you have to make sure that you develop a crusty crust. And if you don't do that, then the, the water which is in the crumb will then soak up the, the crust again, and then you will have quite a leathery crust, which is not that, that great. So um, yeah, that's um, quite important that you, you, you use those um, key processes when you make artisan products. Please, the next slide. So when we talk about mixing, um, important is that we talk about slow speed and fast speed. And also during slow speed, you have the initial phase and also the pickup phase where you actually hydrate and wetting the ingredients um, and give them time also to absorb that water. So the, the slow speed usually takes up to 10 to 12 minutes before you even go to slow speed, eh, to fast speed. And then the fast speed also um, is a cleanup phase and the development phase. And the development phase is then when you're actually developing the gluten structure. And you know a little bit when the, the dough is fully developed, when you hear a noise, it's a special noise when you're developing a dough, um, but also when it gets away from the mixing bowl, when it doesn't stick. And you see that quite good in the photo between the yellow and the green, you see a little bit sticky on the mixing bowl, whereas on the green one, you don't see any um, stickiness on there. When you overmix, you see that on the red picture, um, it will start flatten again, and, and uh, because you destroy the gluten network, and then you actually see um, that it's, it's, it's getting sticky again, and that's when you know it's actually gone. And when do you already know is also the stretch test. Um, so you can see that it's important to get a big chunk of dough out of the bowl, and then you stretch it, and then you can actually, when you stretch it really fast, and then you put it over a newspaper, you should be able to read through those dough what is the headline in the newspaper. Um, and what is quite important, that's why I always compare it with a condom test. Um, people always know that the middle one think it's, it's fully developed, but you still see holes in it. Whereas on the right hand side, the well developed dough, you don't see any holes. And it's like with a condom. Um, if, you, if, you, if you're using a condom, which is not, not really like if you have a hole in the condom, then you probably have nine months later on a surprise and, and you don't want a surprise um, in artisan products as well. So that's why it's important that you really do that um, in there. Then the molding, um, it's important that because we do, we do such a long um, fermentation time, you developed a lot of um, uh, gas bubbles in there and you have to treat it really gently, like your wife or your husband or your boyfriend or your, your, your girlfriend. So um, you, you shouldn't put that much pressure on because you have to put it gently to, to make sure um, 
yeah, that, that you actually keep the, the gas bubbles in there, that you have a nice open texture as well. Next slide, please. And then when you come to proving, when do you know exactly when it's optimal proved? And a good sign is in the middle one, when you're touching the dough and you, you put a little bit on your finger on and you bounce it slightly back, but you still see the fingerprint in the dough, then you know it's absolutely ready. If it bounces back really quickly and you don't see any fingerprint in, then you know you have to take it longer. If it's collapsing, then it's clear, obviously, then it's overproofed. And um, yeah, that's not what you actually want in, in our product. And then the baking process, I mean, that's the, I like that picture because it's, um, we, we made that picture a few years ago um, because it's absolutely the same dough, the same person who did the, the baguette smolding. And one was baked in a rack oven on a baguette tray, then on a normal tray, and then on the oven sole on a deck oven or a normal tray. And you can see when you're baking on the oven sole, you will always have a more open texture just because you have the direct heat on there and it, it will open up uh, the crumb structure um, really nicely and that's what you're looking for. Um, I just put three pictures on, that's um, some bread mixes we sell. Um, one is based on, on spelt, one is based on rye and one is spelt on, on wheat. Um, but we have over 55 different bread mixes which we sell just in Switzerland. And all of them have sourdough in. So, uh, but none of them we actually, actually call sourdough bread because that's just an artisan product we, we use to sell. And people in, or the consumers in Switzerland um, really like or expect that in artisan products there is always sourdough in. There can be sourdough just in a powder form, which you can buy from us or from other companies, but also liquid form, or you can make the sourdough by yourself. And that's the next topic I will talk about. Please, the next slide. Yes. And then the next slide. So sourdough is a growing market and you can see that um, a lot of um, people starting now talking about sourdoughs or making sourdoughs. And if you, if you, if you think back if a few centuries back, I mean, sourdough was the only leavening agent um, which was there for the bakers to make sure that the bread is actually rising. There was no commercial yeast. Um, and then when the commercial yeast um, came into the bakery market, then sourdough got a little bit forgotten and now it's coming back. Um, but I think one of the reasons why it is a revival is um, the product quality. You, with sourdough, you're enhancing the flavor, the texture, and the freshness. And you can do it by yourself. Right? If you have a sourdough by yourself and you're making one product with and one without, um, I guarantee you, you will see the difference in flavor, in texture, in freshness, in the crustiness of the crust. You will see the difference. And that's why it is so good to use sourdoughs um, in products and in artisan products. And also consumers now start, especially after Corona, to have a little bit back, please. Yep. Um, healthy bakery products because they want to have healthy bakery products. And sourdough is a part um, to play in healthy baking um, and also regarding salt reduction. When, you, when you're reducing salt, it's clear that you lack a little bit in flavor. But adding sourdough will help you to reduce that and will support that you have more flavor in the bread, even if you're reducing um, the, uh, the salt. And then also fast food. I mean, fast food is seen as really not healthy. And, and Burger King and also McDonald's have started to use sourdoughs in their burger buns or even pizzas um, to get that image that it's actually more healthier, even though it's still the same product. But adding a sourdough, think that the people or the people then believe it's a little bit more healthier because it's a healthy product in there. And that's also a way of storytelling and communication to the end consumers. And then... During Corona crisis, I mean, the e-commerce, you, you have seen when you go on Google, you can see how many people actually Googled making a sourdough by themselves or making a sourdough bread. And they expect when they go to the baker that they always have sourdough breads available or artisan breads available because they made them sourdough at home and they probably liked the flavor and it was easy to digest. So obviously they want to have that as well when they go out in the shop and, and buy some products. And also the increased demand for clean label shelf life extender. I mean, that is something which, what, I, what, I, what for example, two years ago, I didn't know that actually the pasta industry is using sourdoughs to get an extra shelf life out of it. I mean, if you're ready to use pastas, you can buy in, in, in Tesco's or Morrison's. Some of them even have sourdough in just to get an extra shelf life there because the sourdough is reducing the pH and therefore you have then a longer shelf life one day a longer shelf life on the shelf and that is cost effective and makes it even further. Um, but what is actually the definition of sourdough? The definition of sourdough is basically water and flour and that is fermented by lactic acid bacteria. So you need three ingredients to make a sourdough. 
And what is really important is the increase on acidity level is solely based on the fermentation by the lactic acid bacteria. There are a few companies out there who are actually adding some acids to the, to the dough and, 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 and think they will get a little bit tangy taste and then we can sell it as a, as a sourdough. It's important that when we talk about sourdough, it's a naturally fermented product out of three ingredients, which is flour, water, and lactic acid bacteria. Next slide, please. And now, how you can make a, a sourdough by yourself. Um, you need, as I said, three ingredients, water and flour. And in, you, you can buy lactic acid bacteria, but it's quite difficult. So I usually say, just grab an apple and uh, grate an apple and use the juice of it. And because on the apple, it was in the flour, you have a lot of lactic acid bacteria, um, which you can use, and then um, you can make your own sourdough because you need the lactic acid bacteria for then to consume the starches or the sugars from the, from the flour, and you need the water, and then you make a dough. And then afterwards, if, it's in, if you're using a bucket, you can even see how, um, how high in volume it will be. And then you have to start feeding it again. Um, next slide, please. Quite important is also, but you, you have to, to work really um, hygienic because you, you want to make sure that you're not bringing other um, bacteria into your sourdough because you need lactic acid bacteria and you don't want to have any Echerichia coli or, or any other um, pathogen uh, bacteria which you don't want to have in there. So that's why it's important that you're using really hygienic conditions um, and also that the temperature and the humidity is, is correct. And then once you have the first step um, ahead where you make the, the apple juice and the, the water and the, and the flour, you always have to start feeding them again with new flour, with new water, just to make sure that the bacteria have enough uh, food to produce lactic acid, acidic acid, and also CO2 and alcohol. But you don't have to use apple, you can use any fruit you like. Um, if you have a wine a winery next to you, you can actually say we did um, the sour out of those wineries, just again, the storytelling, which is quite important. And after six to eight days, when you, when you did it right, then you will have your own sourdough and then you have to feed it every single day just to make sure that you can keep them alive. We do it actually, Buckles is doing the same thing. Um, we also use flour, um, water, in the, but instead of using um, apple or, or, a, or a pineapple, for example, we're using the starter culture, which we have isolated a few years ago, um, that we actually know when we're using that lactic acid bacteria or this one and even three together, we know exactly what flavor profile will be occurring during the process. And that's why we're using the, the, the bacteria, another name for, for lactic acid bacteria or starter cultures. And then we ferment them again uh, the same way um, over a period of time. And we also feed them again with water and flour just to make sure that they have enough food. And then after um, a few days, when we know that the, the acidity level and the pH is that what we want and the flavor is also good, we then fill it up into buckets and that's an active sourdough and it's quite a short shelf life. But we have also the option to jam dry products. It's the same similar thing like milk and milk powder. So milk powder is also jam dried or spray dried. Um, and then also you know that you have a longer shelf life of the powder version and it's also nice. It's, you don't have to chill it. You don't have to put it in the fridge. You can keep it outside and you can use a powder as well um, in, your, in your bread uh, artisan products, which gives you the flavor and also um, the, 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 yeah, the nice effects on, on the texture and the crust. So as I said, our firm door assortment, um, and you can go to the next slide. Um, you can see it's, um, it's quite um, a huge variety. You have really um, mild sourdough, so TTA, you can see that that's called a teachable acid. So that means that the acid level of the sourdough, which 25 is really mild, and you can go up to, on the right-hand side, up to 230. And you see also that um, the, the, the lower the, the acidity level is, the brighter are the color, and the, the higher you go with um, the acidity level, then the darker it gets. And obviously, when you're using a darker, it will also interfere with the crumb color, so it will make it up a little bit darker, and it's not that white um, anymore, but, but especially in the UK, in sliced bread, you like that whitey one. That is not possible if you want to have a naturally fermented sourdough with a high TTA, um, it will interfere with the, with the crumb color. And usually a naturally fermented sourdough will never be higher in a TTA level than 200. And you will see that we, we do have a product which is higher than 200, that's the R+, which is a rye-based product. And we spray there, during the drum drying process, we spray in their lactic acid, 
uh, which is an E number, it has to be declared. So this one wouldn't be classified as a naturally fermented sourdough. It is a naturally fermented sourdough, but then we spray on uh, lactic acid to make it even more tangier. And um, so it's important when you buy products in, um, make sure that you actually have a naturally fermented sourdough and you have to ask um, your, um, uh, your person you buy those from that you actually know it is a naturally fermented sourdough. That's quite important. The next one. So, and then what is also nice, you can actually do a firmed or pairing or a sourdough pairing. So if you're making a sourdough, for example, by yourself, which I would say it's quite important that every single bakery has their own sourdoughs, but then you can actually do, you can buy in um, powder products um, from us or from other companies, and then you can blend your sourdough with um, an, uh, a powdered version or a liquid version on top, because they can, you can see on the right-hand side that you will have a different aroma spectrum um, and you can provide also to the consumers different aroma profiles um, with artisanal sourdough products which they like and that's also something which is really special and it makes you unique so the next door neighbor will not have the same product because you're making your own sourdough and then you compare it but you, you pair it with another sourdough and you will always be unique and that is quite important as well and now i'm coming to my last slide um, the application area. A lot of people think that sourdough is only um, used in, in bread products. Um, that is mostly used, but also you can use it in laminated products because the acidity level and, and uh, the sourdough in a product will also interfere with the laminated product with the protein. So when you're making laminated products, croissants or, or Danish pastries, for example, you will always have, you will not have that shrinking effect. Um, because it will interact with the, with, the, with the protein network. And that is something you have less wastage. Um, and we see that a, a few customers of us have started with that. Can you give, please go back? Um, have started with that. But also, for example, the firm or smoked. Um, we have customers who are using that for um, marinate the meat, for a barbecue, for example, or ready to use um, meals. But also for the pasta, I told you that before, but then burger buns, but also cakes, shelf life extension on a clean labor version, but also for butter products. So when you have a lot of rich products in, in butter, for example, a butter plat, um, if you're adding a liquid sourdough to it, it will even enhance uh, the buttery flavor. So you can reduce a little bit the butter, save some money, and you still have a great product. So that was from my side. I know it's quite a lot of information in a short period of time, but that was given. So if you have any questions, um, you're always welcome um, to send me an email. Um, and yeah, that was from, from my from one side. Thank you so much for that. That was so interesting. And I really especially loved hearing about the, um, the different flavor profiles that you can get just by changing the pH. Uh, I'm just going to look and see if we have any questions quickly. Um, Joel here says, which sourdough is the best seller in Switzerland? And do you know why that is? The sourdough, best sourdough? Yeah. Um, in Switzerland, we use really mild sourdoughs. So in, in the UK, you really like those tangy ones. And we don't like to have a really tangy taste. So that's why we have like Swiss probably always in the middle. Um, so we have some really mild sourdoughs, which are quite dark in color. Um, and a lot of people, probably a lot of people heard about um, San Francisco sourdoughs. That is quite a well-known um, brand. And when we detect those sourdoughs, you will always have a lactic, a lactic acid bacteria, San Francisco in it. And people always want to have the San Francisco sourdoughs. So I got asked, hey, do you have a sourdough which is San Francisco sourdough? And I said, 70% or 80% of the sourdoughs which are on the market are already having those lactic acid bacteria from San Francisco in. So therefore, it's just, again, storytelling, um, yeah, to, to, to um, yeah, get that marketing That's right. Good. But in Switzerland, it's, it's a mild sourdough based on wheat um, and wheat germs. Brilliant. We also have a question here. Does the type of mixer affect the quality of the finished bread? That's a really um, interesting one. Well, I say yes, but there will, will be a lot of people would say no. Um, but I, I, I like um, a type of, of diosna mixers, for example, because they are um, quite good because it doesn't generate too much heat. Um, and also um, it helps you to pick up the, the, 
um, the, the ingredients really well. And also when you have the dough hook and the, the mixing bowl, there shouldn't be enough space between it because sometimes you see this or even this, and then it will be difficult when you're mixing that it will pick up the ingredients. So it's quite important that you have not much space uh, between the dough hook and uh, the mixing bowl. Oh, I see. Okay. So I hope that's helped um, our, our members who have asked questions. We've got one more here and then I'm going to ask you a question of my own. So our last question here is, uh, do some of your products contain live sourdough bacteria? So obviously you're selling a kind of longer life solution for sourdoughs, but does that mean they don't contain live sourdoughs or they do? Um, we do. When you're making the sourdoughs and you've seen the presentation before, then every sourdough which we produce is active. Um, and then we can actually fill it into containers. But the shelf life of those products um, is just 10 to 15 days. And we're producing it at one single uh, area, and then we have to ship it to Australia. So we decided a few years ago that we do, for customer, um, if there's a customer request, we will produce the active sourdough, which is active bacteria in there. But most of the time we do produce inactive sourdoughs, um, which is the powder. Um, but when we drying those those slick active sourdoughs into powder, um, you will reduce the amount of the lactic acid bacteria about 95%. So you still have 5% um, active and you still could um, then if you start again with a, a fermentation time to activate them in a further state. But um, it is an inactive sourdough with a little bit of lactic acid in there. So kind of best of both if you're looking for that application then. That's really interesting. So my question to you, which I'm actually going to ask all of our guests, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here. Um, my, our members are bakery students and trainees, as you know. And um, being a baker, we've all had our fair share of bakery fails when you just, it's not your day, something goes wrong. Uh, and I wanted to know what is your biggest bakery fail that you've had? Um, that was in my second apprentice uh, year um, because the first, like there was a bread overnight and then we had to put it into the oven and then because it was so hot, it was 270, so you bake on with 270 and then you have to turn down the, the oven that it's not heating up again. And I had a hangover because I was going straight, it was Saturday morning and I went straight from, from, uh, from the pub into the thing and I was completely hangover and I forgot to turn the, the temperature down. And then I realized that after about 10 minutes, there comes smoke out of the oven. So oh, I realized no. oh, it was all burned. So I started to take off the products, the, the black products, obviously, not fully baked. And I throw it out of the, of the, of the car park. And my boss just arrived oh, to help. Gosh. And I just was throwing out those um, uh, black products. And the problem was, because you can't do it again, because it was the day, made the day before. Um, oh, no. So I had to go in the shop and tell the customers that they will not have that bread today because that's a good I, one. Yeah, <laughs> I like the fact that you were hungover because I think at our regular ABST conference in person, um, that's pretty much the mood of everyone on Saturday setting up for their uh, their pieces for judging. We're all really hungover, so I think we've definitely all been there. But um, that's anyway. what I learned in the UK. That's what I learned in the no. UK. Work hard, play harder. So it's actually quite, that's quite us. A yeah, that's us for sure. <laughs> Okay, brilliant. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us. I know that you're really busy at the moment. Um, for everyone watching, Pascal just had a baby, so send him some congratulations in the chat. Uh, but that makes it all the more incredible that you managed to be here with us today. So yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. And um, yeah, everyone, I'll make sure that the presentation is available to you uh, after this webinar. Perfect. Thank you, thank you so enjoy much. Enjoy the game. Have a great rest yeah. of your day. Thank bye. you. Bye. Bye-bye.